Wild thinking is an antidote for anybody who is tired of reading business books that promise universal answers to um, business issues. Anyone who, who's sick to the back teeth of reading seven immutable laws of marketing or ten ways to boost your business's growth can read Wild Thinking and, and encounter 25 interesting different perspectives that they won't read elsewhere. My name is Nick Little. I'm Director of Consulting at The Clearing. I look after all of the consultancy clients um, uh, and develop their strategy. We'd worked with the School of Life uh, to develop a set of cards uh, called Wild Cards. The Wild Cards are developed as provocative sets of questions to get people doing just that. It was suggested to us by a client um, that they'd really enjoyed using the cards as, as developing kind of thought-provoking conversations at work, and they suggested that we could take 25 of the questions, put them in front of 25 people that we knew, um, and see if anything interesting came out of it. And, and that's how we decided to write the book. Each of the chapters starts with a provocative question. I actually think a lot of readers can quite happily end there if they want to. We wanted to make sure that we had not just interesting questions, but also really interesting people. So we have founders of startups, we have entrepreneurs, but we also have people who work in the charity sector, as well as people who make racing cars go round in circles really, really quickly. We were pretty surprised at the level of honesty that we had from everybody else. So we had a really interesting conversation with John Allett at McLaren um, about his brand's nemesis. We fully expected that we would spend an hour talking to John about McLaren versus Ferrari. It's one of the biggest rivalries in sports and one of the most enduring rivalries as well. We barely talked about Ferrari because McLaren's nemesis is something much more profound. John was extremely clear with us that it's not Ferrari and their rivalry that will kill McLaren. In fact, that really helps McLaren. Um, it's mediocrity that will be the end of the business. That's, that's the existential threat that McLaren faces um, every day. Um, and that's the, the hidden rival, the hidden menace uh, that they seek to eradicate through the work that they do. I think we had a surprise in pretty much every conversation that we had. You know, we spoke to Comic Relief um, about uh, in, in our head, dealing with anxiety, um, we thought there would be something quite interesting about the idea of comedy juxtaposed with anxiety at work. Um, whereas, in fact, you know, the CEO at Comic Relief, she thrives on risk. Um, and so actually the conversation ended up being about how you can lead an organisation that has typically thought of itself in a single way for 20 years and create quite profound cultural change. I think one of the really surprising aspects for us was taking a look at the concept of leadership. A CEO works all of the hours that God can give, and when that CEO is not working, that CEO is running, listening to classical music, trying to improve themselves. And it was really interesting for us talking to people who've been in leadership positions for 40 years um, and, and getting their perspective on how, how you last and go the distance, um, but, but still continue to learn. At the end of each chapter, we have a beautiful illustration with a thought-provoking idea, which we've called a clear defendable territory. In the book, we talk about brands when they work really well being the antidote to indifference, and I, I'd say you've got 25 of those antidotes in the book. If you only look at 25 pages, I would look at those 25. I think one of the hardest things about being a business and having customers is working out whether, when, and if to compromise. Uh, it's a really, really difficult conversation to have because a really great relationship with a client is a little bit like a game of ping pong um, and you're batting ideas to each other. And, and you know, we love challenging clients. We really love it when they challenge us back, when, when that challenge isn't there and you don't always produce the work that makes you proudest. I absolutely love working with people who have opposing views. I think you need to be like-minded in the sense that you want to achieve the same thing, but it's really lovely when you're in a room with someone who thinks completely differently to you, talks completely differently to you, um, comes from a background that's completely different to yours, because that, you know, that's where a form of alchemy can start to happen.
I think the most nerve-wracking question would be whether we always work with the clients that we wished we'd worked with. I don't think we lie about that. I think we're pretty honest, and I think the clients that we love hopefully really feel the love that we have for them, and the clients that we don't will know because we w would have worked with them once and never again. Um, I think we're a relatively honest bunch, but that's certainly the thing that probably brings me out in a cold sweat when, when, you, when you contemplate that question. I wish that one of us had won the lottery um, and that all of the work that we could do could be for the clients that, that you know, we passionately believe can change the world because we do turn a lot of people down, even though we believe in what they do, because we can't subsidise every single project that we work on. I would love to be in a position to take, take on all of that work.